TLO, what's poppin'? We are on Twitch, we are not live, but you can leave a like and comment, turn on post notification bells, let's continue to grow the family from Chicago to the UK, um, right behind me, you know, this twitch.com, if we go live and you miss it, just type in this username and you can rewind, fast forward, do your thing, man, don't forget we do got merch, and we also got the Patreon, we post Monday through Friday, man. I just wanted to hurry up, man. This is Swamp Stories. I believe we watched a couple things from Swamp Stories. Because I am subbed. But th this one got me. Chicago's most vicious GDs. How one man caught 11 of them. And is facing 875 years. That's tough. Let's listen to it, man, because I ain't never really seen no stories about the about the numbers on here, so let's check it out. Mm -hmm. Just gotta be a first. Welcome back to another episode of Swamp Stories. For this video, we cover a story that you probably never heard of. As you know, the south side of Chicago has numerous stories that are always talked about. Whether it's the Oblockian 6030ians. It'd be hard pressed for me to not hear, but I'm from here, so all right, No anyway. Limit or even 051. Obviously, these are grave situations that are constantly covered for a reason. But Chicago is a giant city, and there are plenty of situations that are equally as bad but are never talked about. And for this video, we cover probably the wildest one I've covered. Worse. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of things going on in the city, or even under in the surrounding suburbs, some of the surrounding suburbs that you'll never hear about because it's not the popular people to talk about. For today, this one is crazy, trust me. But before we get into it, let me run the intro. The story begins in Englewood, long known as Chicago's worst south. You mean Englewood? The bro said Englewood? Alright. Side neighborhood. The area is your typical low income hood with the average income sitting at just 22000 a year. On top of this, it ranks in the top two most violent jurisdictions in Chicago. Because of this, residents are constantly on edge and they know that something can pop off at any moment. Regardless, people from this environment are used to it so they still enjoy fun activities in the neighborhood. The same positive things still go on here like anywhere else, just with an added sense of danger. And that takes us to April 5th, 2008. I feel like when he said that he kind of under, under, undervalued what really be, when stuff is going on in the city like that, it is allowed. It's allowed because it's for a good cause. But even if, even if like something was to go down or somebody I was to be spotted, you're right. This is out of a sense of danger because there's no morals. There's no there's no law, rules of war out there of engagement. It's all outlaws. Nobody has no, you know what I'm saying? So that's why they say when it's up, it's up in the rack. So anyway, continue. It's a nice spring day in Englewood and everyone is happy to be outside after a brutal winter. And on this day, a family is celebrating their son's 8th grade graduation on their front lawn. Everyone is outside sharing laughs and having a great time. But then out of nowhere, two young men at the gathering begin arguing and start making threats. A young man who lives right next door hears the commotion and looks out his window. He sees a situation that could potentially end badly and his instincts kick in. So he instantly puts on his clothes and runs outside. The man's name is Albert Vaughn, a recent honors graduate from Julian High School. Well, Albert decides to walk into his neighbor's yard and tell everyone to relax. He even puts his arms out to separate the people arguing. And this right here is a major mistake in Chicago. The people at the party do not take well to Albert's intervention and they all begin to get in his face. So he starts- Yeah, that's the thing, man, about Chicago. If you arguing, if you see two people arguing, let them man, let them argue because that energy is definitely going to shift towards you every time. It's backing up and walking. And they was probably homies too that was arguing like 
rocks off their property. For whatever reason, the people follow him onto the curb and they begin to surround him. So in response, Albert picks up a wooden plank and holds it up. Even though he's just protecting himself, one of the partygoers does not like this at all. This would be 27-year-old Nathaniel Tucker, a man who had been arrested for 11 felonies in 5 years. Well, Nathaniel instantly runs inside the house looking for a man. I started at Purdue Global because... As he's grabbing the bat, Chicago police coincidentally arrive to the scene. All they see is Albert holding up a plank, so they order him to put it down and turn around. As Albert turns around and puts his hands up, Nathaniel comes running out of the house. He sprints all the way up to Albert and BAM! That's terrible timing. Like, that's terrible timing for a uh, buddy that ran out that house. Thankfully, Nathaniel was arrested at the scene. The incident devastated the- Thankfully, thankfully the police would have moved a little closer to the situation. And especially the Vaughn family. The family was proud of their son as he had graduated high school and enrolled in college. Albert's father had raised him as a stand-up man and made sure to keep him off the streets of Chicago. Well, during the weeks after the incident, the family started a foundation in his name. The Albert Vaughn Foundation would be used to bring community activities to the streets of Englewood. And this is how Albert's three brothers made it their mission to keep his name alive. These would be Alvin, Alex, and Robert Vaughn. Through the foundation, the brothers started a three-on-three -three basketball league to bring the community together. The league was a major success and truly created a brotherhood of friends and family. They all hung out on a daily basis and began to call themselves Goonie Boss. The idea was that everyone in the squad was their own boss, but that they were not scared to defend themselves. Essentially, they were a good group of guys just trapped in a terrible neighborhood. The original members would of course be Alex, Alvin, and Robert Vaughn. Then would be one of their close friends named Jonathan Jackson, also known as Big John. Another would be an aspiring rapper named... Started a gang in response to their brother's passing. R.I.P. though, for real. That's an unfortunate way. Named Alonzo Williams, also known as King Englewood. Jonathan and Alonzo were best friends to the Vaughn brothers, closer than blood could be. Well, over the years, they became known as the Hustlers and Fly Guys in Englewood. While everyone else was beefing, they were just there having a great time. They stayed in their lane and made sure to never step on anyone's toes. But then came the year 2012, when a new member would come along and ruin everything. In 2011, an unexpected man began showing up to the Goonie Basketball League. This would be a local man named Romeo Blackman, also known as O-Dog. O-Dog grew up in the streets of Englewood and was always known as a feared bully in the area. So when he- With a nickname like O-Dog? Yeah, he gotta be like that. He first showed up to the league, everyone was confused. Why do you want to be here? And of course, the Vaughn brothers knew his reputation very well. However, because they're kind-hearted, they decided to look past it and give him a chance. Well, right off the bat, O-Dog and the Goonies became good friends, and they began hanging out all the time. O-Dog really took a liking to the Goonies, as he saw them as the cool guys in Englewood who liked to have fun. And the Goonies found him to be a fun guy to be around as well. However, O-Dog was not the change man that the Vaughn brothers thought. In fact, his true intentions were to turn the Goonies into a powerful gang in the streets of Englewood. O-Dog had an obsession with power and he was willing to do anything to get it. So essentially, joining the Goonies was his opportunity to climb the ranks and begin telling everyone what to do. And by 2013, his plan came into works. He convinced the Vaughns to let him lead the Goonies and this is how the madness started. His first step was recruiting his own members, ones that he could trust to be loyal and put in work. First, he recruited his right-hand man named DeMarco Bennett, also known as Marco. Marco happens to be King Vaughn's first cousin. Then he recruited his own cousin named Rashad Wells, also known as Tay Boog. Next would be a man named Terrence Smith, also known as T. T and Marco were two well-known steppers in Englewood, so this was a big deal. And after them would be another two steppers named Jolicious Terman and Lil Mo. Now this right here was a squad to be reckoned with, and the Vaughns had no no idea what O-Dog created. At first, they had no rivals, but O-Dog still wanted all the Goonies to carry a blink. And that takes us to January 10th, 2014. 
It's a cold Chicago winter day and Goonie member Big John is driving down South Racine Boulevard. As he's cruising, a Chicago police car gets behind him and hits the lights. So Big John pulls over and the officer asks to search the car. Inside the car, the officer finds a blicky and just like that, Big John is arrested and booked. should have said no. Booked into Cook County. Why did it get pulled over for? It wasn't no probable cause. Jail. In the state of Illinois, this is a class four felony, punishable by a minimum of one to three years. Of course, the goon. Yeah, you out of there were upset, but one to three years was not the end of the world. And just like that, one of the original Goonies was gone for the foreseeable future. Or maybe not. Within just three days, Big John was released from Cook County Jail. This surprised everyone and even made some- Hold on, Big John. What you- You Italian beef and Pepsi did it? What's going on? Member skeptical. Specifically, O Dog was paranoid that Big John was a snitch. So, to confirm his suspicions, he began asking fellow members what they thought. Big John's best friend named King Englewood told him to hold off and that he didn't snitch. On top of this, the Vaughn brothers all told him the same thing. There are all kinds of reasons a case can be dropped, and anyways, who did he snitch on? It made zero sense, but O Dog was a fiend. That's true. It, that, that, that's very true. Like, Y'all haven't done anything yet. So what would y'all, what would he snitch, what is there to snitch about? See, I didn't even think about that. <clears throat> for conflict. One week later, January 22nd, 2014, O-Dog texts Big John to tell him that they need to meet up and talk. So at 4 p.m., O-Dog pulls up to Big John's apartment. He then walks inside his building and meets him in the hallway. Together, they walk upstairs to his apartment, and that's when O-Dog makes a wild decision. This incident devastated the original Goonie Boss members. In their minds, this was completely unnecessary, especially without proof. The majority of original members were scared to speak up in fear of O-Dog. However, one original member had enough heart to speak up. This would be Big John's best friend, King Englewood. King approached O-Dog and told him that he was upset with his irrational decision. He told him that Big John was solid and that he made a terrible mistake. This was a bold decision, and O-Dog was furious. King Englewood was now on his list. March 21st, 2014. Mm, O-Dog was wild. He didn't care about nothing. All he wanted was negativity. It's a Friday morning in Englewood, and King is outside on the block at 10.30 a.m. Specifically, he's hanging out in the alley a block down from Big John's apartment. Little does he know O-Dog is surfing around looking for him. O-Dog can't find him on Racine, but he knows that he's somewhere in the vicinity. At 10.40, he heads down West 70th and spots King Englewood outside. So he casually hops out of the car and walks down to the alley. He approaches King Englewood and without saying a word, King Englewood was a popular young man and the whole community was hurt. Neither S3. him or Big John had done anything to warrant what O-Dog did to them. As you would expect, the Goonies and the Vaughn brothers were not happy about what he had done. However, they knew that they were no match for O-Dog and his boys, so they had to just go along. O-Dog was truly becoming the feared leader he wanted to be, and this was a scary sight. O-Dog was destined to create a force on the south side and nothing was going to get in his way. His first step was officially claiming a territory, the corner of 71st and Aberdeen. This is where the Goonies could now be seen on a daily basis. The territory wasn't claimed by anyone before, but the location was a very dangerous choice. The Goonies were surrounded by vicious gangs at every angle, literally just He was surrounded by other GDs, and then there was some stones. Just one block away. Just a block down on 72nd and Aberdeen was Push Squad, a reputed BD set. Then directly oh. across Aberdeen is the Black Pea Stones, known as May Block. This was a dangerous predicament, but that's why O-Dog chose it. In fact, he was eager to use any inconvenience as a reason to Investors who own gold have earned higher overall return. I'm familiar with that area. It's one of the Where best performing assets are? of this. To start a beef. 
During this time, if you even looked at O-Dog for too long, he considered you an op. Well, in early October, O-Dog went to the club with a couple of goonies. At the club, the goonies were partying looking to have a great time like they usually do. But O-Dog was in there for the sole purpose of finding a reason to get on anyone. Long story short, O-Dog got what he was looking for. He got into an argument with a reputed Englewood set. This would be Chunky City, a reputed set located 15 blocks west of the goonies. For most- This is how you know how Chicago is very clicked up. This is two GD sets. They made both GDs. Didn't care. <laughs> it's really like this. Not just an old dog situation, though. City, a reputed set located 15 blocks west of the Goonies. For most people, this would be a forgotten incident, but for O-Dog, it was a reason to start a beef. And just like that, the Goonies had their first ops, and Chunky City wasn't even aware. October 23rd, 2014. It's a regular Thursday afternoon in Englewood and the Goonies are hanging out with O-Dog. O-Dog is excited about a new member named Quante Hughes and he's eager for him to put in work. So at 6pm, O-Dog tells Quante about a section that he got into it with in the past weekend. He tells him that Chunky City members disrespected him and that he needs to make a statement. So Quante feels his anger and volunteers to slide. 7.20pm, O-Dog, Quante, and Terrence Smith hop in a Dodge Caravan and head to Chunky City. City. They put on their masks and gloves and begin circling the area. As they head up 72nd, they notice a man standing on the block. So instantly, O-Dog tells Quante to stop the car and let's go. They then open the doors of the van and O-Dog and Terrence hop out. The man starts running, but the Goonie- I ain't gonna lie, O-Dog back in 2014, he was hopping out on foot. He was walking stuff down. I don't condone it. But he was doing it. He's eventually catch up. Directly after doing this, O-Dog and Terrence sprint back to the car and they drive away. As the Goonies are taking off, they notice a cop car behind them. They all figure they're screwed, but O-Dog tells them to calm down. He instructs Quante to speed up and make a left at the next corner. He then tells him to stop the car and for everyone to sprint in different directions. O-Dog and Terrence run between the houses and Quante takes off down the street. When the police catch up, all they see is Quante running away. They eventually catch up and Quante is arrested. O-Dog and Terrence were somehow able to make it home on foot without leaving a trace. O-Dog was nervous that Quante would snitch, but he never did such a thing. After such a close call, you held the ten toes. GDs don't snitch. You'd expect the guys to lay low and reconsider what they're doing. But no, O-Dog was a sick-minded individual and this amped him up even more. In fact, just a month later, Terrence and O-Dog would slide again. While targeting a Chunky City member, the duo would accidentally hit a 25-year-old woman named Crystal Jackson. The terrible incident sparked major outrage in the community and caused everyone to start hating O-Dog. Even the Goonie yeah, members the were disgusted you hit somebody by what he had done. Over. Specifically, Alex and Alvin Vaughn could not believe what the Goonies turned into. This right here is very pivotal in the story, but we're not quite there yet. In the meantime, we focus on the Goonies' next rivalry. Right down the street happened to be Push Squad, a reputable BD set. When the Goonies claimed the territory right next door, Push Squad was not too thrilled. And as you know, hearing about this is enough to set off O-Dog. December 13th, 2015, 9.45 AM. O-Dog hops in a silver Chrysler with Marco Bennett in the passenger seat. They slide around the Push Squad area, just a block away from where they reside. On the corner of 72nd and May, they spot a member named Smiley. O -Dog instantly tells Marco to hop out. So Marco hops out and runs across the street. Bang. Marco runs back to the car and O-Dog speeds off. He heads north for five minutes until a Chicago police car gets behind him. He stays calm until the police turn on their lights and then he takes off. Once he gets some distance, he makes a ride on 51st and tells Marco to hop out. Marco runs inside the nearest building and runs up the stairs. He realizes there's nowhere to go, so he throws his blicky out of the window into the backyard. He then runs back downstairs where he's surrounded by Chicago police. Just like that, Marco is arrested for evading police. And
and only that. And for O-Dog, he was able to get away after a short pursuit. Now you may be wondering how he got away, but this will explain it. O-Dog was only- O-Dog elusive as hell, goddamn. He pulled over for not using a turn signal. The officer had no clue about the incident on 72nd. So that's why police gave up on the pursuit. It simply was not worth it. And police got only it, tied Marco it. to the incident once they discovered the blicky in the backyard. On top of this, a witness would come forward and identify Marco as the one who did it. And just like that, he was cooked. For life. Once again, Oda got lucky. He started this for absolutely zero reason, only because he felt disrespected. And now he was the primary rival of- Honestly, in Chicago, that's all it take. If you feel any type of disrespect, you gotta go stand on. <laughs> that's what a lot of people's mindset is in Chicago. That's why Chicago's so messed up. Somebody step on your shoes, that's disrespect. We gotta get you going out of there. You gotta get out of there. Some people. Not all, but- so that's why so they wild. wanted him gone right away. So for the next few months, Push Squad members searched and searched for O-Dog. They targeted him on several occasions, but he survived each one. The rivalry was on and O-Dog was not playing fair. January 15th, 2016. It's a freezing cold morning in Englewood and O-Dog and a fellow member are searching for rivals. Together, they're looking for Push Squad members they can find around 70 seconds. They check back a few times, but they can't find anyone outside. Well, at this same time, a young man named Devon Horace is on his way to 72nd in May to pick up a girl. Devon is known as D-Money and he's from a section that has nothing to do with Goonie politics. Well, at 11.15, D-Money arrives on May Street and double parks and puts on his blinkers. As he's waiting for the girl to come outside, O-Dog and Tay Boog are driving up the street. They notice the car double parked and they get suspicious. So O-Dog double parks at the end of the street and hops out with Tay Boog. They walk towards D-Money's car and he notices them approaching. So he instantly opens his door and that's when things go left. O-Dog sadly unleashes. O-Dog and Tay Boog would skirt away and get away with this. Everyone was shocked and once D-Money's hood found out what it was about, they were not too thrilled. They were now added to the list of O-Dog haters. D-Money was a popular figure in their hood, so much so that they changed their name from Tay Town to D-Town. Once Push Squad found out about the story, they reached out to D-Town and decided to join together. This was bad news for O-Dog and the Goonies. March 15th, 2016. A Goonie member. It's crazy because half of the Goonies didn't even want to be on that. Ever named Cuzzy is grabbing food from the market on 69th and Racine. Cuzzy is not a factor for the Goonies. He's simply just a close friend of the Vaughns. Regardless, his associations. Yeah, that don't matter. You, you might as well be a, a member. Make him a big target for the rivals. Well, at 7.30 p.m., he grabs his food and walks out of the store. And right there are two men with masks. Bang. This was Goonie Boss's first loss on paper, and when O-Dog found out, he was furious. At this point, O-Dog was disappointed that none of the Goonies were sliding on their own. For most members, this is because they didn't understand what they were sliding for. No one had ever done anything to them, but now the Goonie members had a reason to be upset. Specifically, a member named Christian Civils was upset, especially because he was close friends with Cuzzy. And for this reason, he had his eyes set on revenge on D-Town. So in- mm, That's all it take. One little wrong death turned somebody savage up. Now he, now he liked that forever. Instantly, he began spinning around Christian. looking for D-Town members. And finally, he was able to get a drop. May 21st, 2016. Christian Civils gets word that a D-Town... Town member is hanging out not too far from Goonie territory. Specifically, he gets word that Duke from D Town is hanging out in Crazyville. So at 7:30 p.m., Christian heads to Crazyville looking for Duke. At 7:44, he drops. Every time I watch like a Chicago like documentary, I ain't really got nothing to say. It's too familiar, so it's like eh. 
drives down 70th and notices Duke standing outside a music video. Christian knows that there's too many people outside for him to hop out, so he makes another decision. He simply rolls down his window and bang. Sadly, five days later, O-Dog would do the same. Except this time, he was looking for Push Squad. May 26, 2016, 2.45 p.m. It's a Thursday afternoon in Englewood and a Push Squad member is getting his hair cut. On the south side of Chicago, barbershops are some of the most dangerous places one can be. This is because... Barbershops, gas stations, corner stores, <coughs> outside. Because ops can accidentally meet there, but also because you're sitting in the same spot for over an hour. Well, the Push Squad member happens to be getting his hair cut at Powell's, a local barbershop on 63rd in May. As he's walking in the shop, a man walking out recognizes him as a Push Squad member. The man who's a friend of O-Dog texts him about what he had seen. Instantly, O-Dog leaves his house and hops in his gray Chrysler. He arrives 10 minutes later and double parks outside of the barbershop. And this is when he makes a truly devastating decision. From outside the barber shop, he simply unleashes. After doing this, he hops back in his car and drives straight to Alvin Vaughn's apartment. He tells Alvin that he caught a Push Squad member and to check the news. As they check the news several hours later, they realize that Gerald Sias was not the intended target. Alvin and Alex Vaughn are sick to their stomachs, but for whatever reason, O-Dog simply does not care. This infuriates Alex and Alvin, inching them one step closer to their breaking point. However, we're still not quite there yet. Sadly, O-Dog's madness would continue. After this wild act, O-Dog decides to take a break from the streets of Chicago. He decides to visit family in a small Illinois town just two hours south of Chicago. Particularly, he visits his distant cousin named Gerald Bumper, also known as Goldie. Goldie was born in Englewood, but his family moved to the small town of Streeter to escape the madness. If you're unfamiliar, which you are, Streeter is a small country town where nothing happens. This is where Goldie was raised from elementary- I ain't gonna lie, I'm even unfamiliar. I ain't never heard of no Streeter, Illinois. Ever through high school, surrounded by nothing but farmers and small town living. Well, around 2015, O-Dog had poisoned his mind and recruited him to help out the Goonies. Because he wasn't in the streets, Goldie could legally purchase Blickies under the radar. Essentially, O-Dog used him to get Blickies as he'd pay him over retail. This is how business was conducted for over a year. Well, then came the summer of 2016 when O-Dog was flat out broke and could no longer afford to buy them. This was a problem, but O-Dog would always come up with a solution. He contacted Goldie and pitched him on the idea of hitting a lick in Streeter. Hitting the same store where Goldie used to buy the Blickies. Well, Goldie agreed and the plan was on. O-Dog and two Goonie members drive- I ain't gonna lie, robbing a gun store is never the- never the move. Drive down to Streeter. Like at June night? 21st, 2016, 10.30 p.m. O-Dog and two Goonies drive from Streeter to the small town of Spring Valley. There, they look around for unattended cars to steal. At 10.40, O-Dog spots a black Jeep Wrangler at a gas station. He tells the Goonies to drop him off and to meet him at the Blicky store. So he hops out of the car and jumps in the Jeep. He quietly pulls off and hits the freeway back to Streeter. At 11.25, everyone arrives at South Post gunsmithing. O-Dog then backs the Jeep in front of the doors. He tells the members to stand clear as he puts the car in reverse and slams on the gas. He breaks through the front door and they all run inside with their bags. After five The number of clients... I think I remember this, hearing about this. It ain't gonna lie, it sounds super familiar. Minutes, they all hop in O-Dog's Chrysler and drive back to Chicago. Somehow, they were able to get away with this. However, over the next week, O-Dog became extremely paranoid. 
He trusted his two goonies to stay solid if they ever got arrested, but for Goldie, he was sure that he would snitch because he's not from the streets. For this reason, O-Dog refused to drive Goldie back to Streeter. O-Dog was a paranoid man and he needed to keep his eyes on him at all times. And finally, after 8 days, O-Dog could no longer handle the anxiety. On June 30th, Goldie was found in an Englewood back alley. Goldie was, I mean, uh, O-Dog is out of control. This man got no, no, no brain. He lost it. O-Dog truly reached a new low with this one, his own family who did absolutely nothing wrong to him. When Alex Vaughn heard about this, he was sick to his stomach once again. O-Dog had zero impulse control and you simply never knew who was next. On this day, the Vaughn brothers first considered turning him into police. O-Dog no longer had any friends who trust him, instead just a bunch of dudes who were too scared to ever confront him. And that takes us to the next day. On June 31st, 2016, Robert Vaughn was found inside his car in Englewood. This was another devastating loss to the Vaughn family and another finally brother. it was their last straw. As a result of this, Alex Vaughn was completely distraught and he needed to take out his anger. So he decided to go to a local shooting range and let out some stress. Somehow he forgot he was a felon and this is an illegal activity. So after showing the range his ID, they were forced to say goodbye to call 911 and have him arrested. At this point, Alex is thinking that the universe is simply unfair. To lose another brother and then get locked up for something silly. Hey, being locked up might have prolonged your life though. With old dog out there, jail, hey, jail is a preservation of life when you in the streets or somebody is on your ass. So... Oh my goodness. All while O-Dog is outside destroying the universe and never facing any consequences. So after being arrested, Alex makes a very bold decision. He decides to tell police every single thing O-Dog has ever done. He even tells them how Goonie Boss started and all of the little details. He shows them the Facebook- Well, I'd be hard pressed to believe that he had a- he was in, not in PC in jail. Pages of all of the members and all of the self-incriminating posts. Essentially, he tells them the entire story of Goonie Boss. How they were initially peaceful and then how O-Dog ruined everything. This was extremely bold and Chicago police had never seen anything like it before. Ali yeah, even the police is astonished. He gotta be in a... I don't know where he... Where he at now? That's tough. That's a... It's a tough choice to make. Alex Vaughn single-handedly built a major RICO case on Goonie Boss. On October 26, 2018, five Goonie Boss members were indicted. Ten homicides in total, nine of which done by O-Dog himself. Upon his indictment, O-Dog was facing a total of 875 years. Because of this, many people in Chicago consider O-Dog the worst that the streets have ever seen. Chicago police even admit this themselves. In fact, they even conducted a study of when O-Dog was in Chicago versus out of town. What they found out is that the crime rate in Englewood plummeted when O-Dog was out of town. That's how absolutely insane this man was. It's truly a blessing that Alex Vaughn had the courage to take him down in court. As of today, a total of 23 members have either been con- I'm curious to- what's Alex Vaughn- what he on now? Convicted or are still fighting in court. What will happen, who knows, but it's safe to say that these are some of the worst GDs in Chicago history. And to everyone out there, let this be a lesson that who you. Tell like, comment, subscribe, turn on your post, I'm gone.